As if it wasn't bad enough that Griffith had taken everything from Guts, he had to rub salt in the wound by burning down the first person who not only understood what Guts was going through, but offered to help him since the eclipse. This whole time, he's taken the burden of this on his own shoulders without really that much help, but now someone has offered to make his situation better, and Griffith won't even let him have that. Grunbelt's huge size is obviously nothing that Guts is scared of, and he stands strong against him despite it. This fight is awesome. Each image's emphasis on the impact of Grunbeld's hits make it feel so real and intense. I like the image of the armor shown between his eyes. It's a materialization of the monster within him. With the armor, pain doesn't matter to him. He doesn't care. He only has the instinct to kill, like the monster materialized from the emotional pain he's dealt with. We see the slash of his blade separating them, emphasizing the duality between both sides. Grunbeld's design is honestly pretty fucking awesome. In his second form, he's a dragon made of crystals, symbolizing pride. The dragon is an image of wickedness in both the chivalric and Christian beliefs. In the Orient, it represents force, intelligence, and strength. In many conventions, it is the epitome of disorder and untamed nature. He's the perfect opponent for Guts, and one of the most powerful monsters he's fought so far, but Guts doesn't care about that. He just got wounded by Slan, and he's still ready to kick some ass. Contrasted to Grunveld, Guts is absolutely insane, from his fighting style to the life he's led. He is completely shrouded in insanity and darkness, but this is why him and Shierke make such a good team. Shierke's duty is to help him retain his innocence. She represents the last bit of purity he has left. It really reinforces the idea that meeting the right people can help you in ways you can't predict. Guts continues to murder the Apostles, assaulting Serpico and Isidro, and afterward one that discovered Farnese and Casca. He lifts his helmet, a fix of white hair showing up over his eye as a result of abusing the armor. <laughs> Shierke's attempts to telepathically communicate with Guts lead to her seeing firsthand what's constantly been eating him up inside all this time, but in the form of nightmare imagery. Majestic light with the bonfire of dreams and memories that light up the darkness in his life. But the insanity begins to build and build with each image before we transition to a single solitary light sitting alone. Deep down, under all that rage and trauma, Guts is broken up and torn apart, and tired of fighting. As soon as they leave, Shierke looks up at her mistress as she's shrouded in fire. It emphasizes well how much Shierke strives to be just like her, a shining star burning bright to the end. Shierke is forced to deal with the loss of her mistress, but she's okay, because she knows that this journey is a new beginning, as well as her duty. Mishka surrounded by decapitated heads. Not only does it look awesome, but it shows us exactly how egotistical he is with just one image. I want to take note of him trying to force himself on Charlotte. His dark desires literally overpower her, showing he's just like the king from before. The part where the pregnant woman is needlessly murdered also emphasizes that, despite the fact that this is a different culture, the world here is just as grim and as dark as it is everywhere else, especially for women. That's also why we see the jagged hands of hell, or I guess humanity, reach up to the bird in the sky. He's far too pure and heavenly to exist in this dark, desolate land. It's quickly followed up by an image of the moon just above the monster, resembling the eclipse. The world is dark and it consumes and isolates Princess Charlotte until we see Griffith come through her window, just like last time. Zod flies her away in her bed, almost like a dream. The image looks just like the one from the Lost Children arc, where her wings were spread wide to emphasize her freedom. I suppose, in this particular context, the freedom is Charlotte's. She's been saved from that dark place. She's safe now and no longer a victim. We see the same moon, but this time with the Skull Knight standing on a rock over water. Unlike Zod, he is not flying and there is no bed. He isn't stuck in his dreams. He's grounded in reality and down to earth. He hasn't lost sight of who he is and given into a desire for power. And that reflects perfectly on the kind of person Guts is as well. Speeches represent the meeting between your two states of mind, the materialistic nature and spiritual nature. The sea and shore are two sides of the same coin, just like the normal and astral realms, and just like Guts and Griffith. 
I do want to talk about the fact that Shirake has a crush on Guts. Honestly, you gotta feel bad for the kid, because she falls in love with someone who very obviously she has absolutely no chance with, but it kind of makes sense. He's strong-willed, but deep down a kind soul just tormented by pain. Shirake is a mage, so a lot of her job includes healing people, and I'm sure in some way she wants to heal Guts' pain. It's a bit wholesome, and I think it says a lot about her as a character. Also, before people try to see this as, like, me being pro Shirke X Guts, I'm not. That ship kind of grosses me out. The image that pains me the most is the picture of the old Casca etched in the back of Guts' mind. It's clear he still loves Casca more than anything and will do anything to help her come back to him. Which is fitting, as shortly after we see a young boy appear out of nowhere. It's highly likely that this mysterious kid is the embodiment of Guts and Casca's child. Not a physical manifestation, as his body is inhabited by Griffith, but perhaps his soul coming to see his parents. I find it charming that, despite having the mind of a child, Casca's first instinct is to protect the child. Her motherly instincts kick in, and suddenly she has something she wants to protect. It's clear she's not sure how to do it, however, and Guts has to jump in to help. And for a moment, they almost kind of look like a married couple really cute. You can really feel the impact of every forceful swing and it flows together pretty nicely. The armor is completely consuming guts front to back. Armor is typically a device meant to protect the wearer from harm, but this one destroys them inside and out. We see an image of him surrounded at all angles by gaping mouths eager to feast on him just like the Eclipse. I love the pure insanity of these panels shaped as the armor's eyes with his human eyes corresponding to the mouths of the monsters, showing how he's becoming the very beast he kills. But Shirke comes, and it becomes clear that she is a source of light to brighten all this darkness. Friends are there for each other. And just... God, would you look at this ocean, man. Like, I don't even know how to gush about this anymore without just repeating myself. The art to Berserk is just... amazing. I'd like to bring your attention to the men who were hanged randomly. We know very little about them, and that's partially the point. They're just a bunch of random people being killed for the status they were born with. Just lives being taken for absolutely no fucking reason whatsoever. In a way that's very similar to the pain and torment that Guts and Casca had to endure their entire lives as well. Fuck you for being born seems to be the lesson they've had to learn since their lives started. It's some pretty interesting and cool commentary on imperialism and class, just like the monsters attacking the ball later on. We see this civilized society being invaded by beasts of the night, or quote-unquote savages. It's very interesting is all I'm saying. I like how the slave traders are depicted as demonic and evil, just like the Eclipse. I also really like the setup for the pirate apostle guy that we're gonna fight, like, not that long from now. It fits super well with the theme of freedom, as pirates represent some romantic notion of escape. I'll get more into that later. For now, I want to talk about the dramatic irony of Shierge meeting our forehead girl, aka Griffith's biggest simp. She recounts a story to Shierge that entails her giving metaphors and weird comparisons to animals and shit. <laughs> the discussion is obviously taking place right in front of a beautiful image of the sea for a good reason. The ocean is the beginning of life on Earth and symbolizes formlessness, the unfathomable, and chaos. The ocean can also be seen as a symbol of stability, as it can exist largely unchanged for centuries. It's a bit like life, constantly flowing, yet never changing. Sonia sees meeting Griffith as her own personal, quote-unquote, beginning to her life, and not much has really changed for Griffith or for Guts since the story had begun, yet somehow it's still different. She offers to join Griffith's team, but Shirke turns it down because of her own destiny and path. She's here to help Guts on his path of survival, and it really shows how Guts has finally found his own ideal. God, she's so fucking cute! Also, Guts is just a fucking chat. Sonya really is an interesting character, and I like her a lot, but most of the fans that I've run into absolutely hate her Guts, and I don't really understand why, aside from just really dumb reasons that make absolutely no sense. I honestly don't really hate her that much, and I actually like her. It makes me a bit sad, because she, honest to God, doesn't know the kind of person Griffith is. 
if you put yourself in her shoes, you'll understand that if your life up until this point has been suffering and then suddenly this extremely attractive hero comes in and saves you, yeah, you're going to be a little bit attached. It's just a bit annoying to see it all. Do you even remember seeing how careless she is around those apostles? She's naive and foolish, and I feel bad for her. Leave her alone. Bernice gets to learn from Shiarke, which is fitting, as now Sh Shiarke has turned from student to teacher, passing the ideas down regardless of her age. It's important to know that Farnese also submits to her father, but realizes at the last minute that it was Guts who set her free, and that she really can't just submit to his wishes anymore. Because of Guts' rebellion, she is learning that she has the ability to fight for herself. Boats represent a journey through life, and in a way, this boat is the first step to a new beginning for everyone involved. Especially the fans. Because it went hiatus at the time. And we were on a boat for like, fucking three years, dude. Barneys must first face the horrifying home that she left behind once more before we can begin this journey. But here, she feels lost, which is why the garden almost resembles a maze. Flowers represent innocence, which is why she's surrounded by them. It's also why there's a burning flower in the opening of Berserk, and even the scene of this guy comparing her to a lily. Deep down, there is an innocent, sad girl that she buries. We see the cold snow juxtaposed to that same apple, which represents her place in Guts' group. Farnese's inability to help and constant feeling of uselessness, like she doesn't even belong here, parallels a lot with that of Guts, and much like Guts, it is burning away her happiness. We see this beautiful image of her life thus far, with her isolated right in the middle of it. While we're talking about inadequacy, I like the scene of Isidro looking at Guts from behind. Framed well, because it shows that he real, can't really catch up to Guts. Guts will always be ahead of him, and he still hasn't figured out why or if there even is a way to catch up to him. It really gives you something to think about. This is the second time that Serpico and Guts have fought. Much like last time, it's in a limited area. But this time, it's limited due to the columns of the building. Any move can tear the place down, and Serpico uses his environment to best Guts once again, but Guts pushes through, telling you a lot about both of them as characters, as well as their dynamic with each other. I love the image of Farnese and Serpico sitting at the window. It symbolizes an illumination in the darkness of their home. Serpico admires Farnese and would genuinely do anything for her safety. It's the one thing he cares about most because she's the one that's been there for him through all of this pain and darkness. Serpico, honest to God, didn't really want to stop Guts, he just needed this fight. They both did. Regarding the scene at the party, Puck makes a joke that I thought was pretty funny. It's on the, it's on the screen now. But what's funny about it is that it shows how the gluttony of the monster parallels with the gluttony of these rich, privileged fucks at this party. Guts saved them, and all they can even remotely think about is how beneficial he's going to be if he fights in their armies. You think, why would Farnese want to stay here with these obnoxious pieces of shit? I mean, she won her place in the world because she chose to work for it. She's different now. This isn't who she is. The king says it's an illusion, but to be honest, I really don't think he truly believes that. I think he just wanted to avert judgment for her, but deep down is genuinely proud of her for how far she's come. Basically, this person recognizes who Guts is, and embarrasses him in front of his new friends by bringing up his past. It's harsh because when you really think about it, Guts didn't feel happy or like he had a place to belong until he joined the Band of the Hawk. After he lost it, he was hopeless again, just like before, but now he's moved on. And this random asshole just has to bring up the past, which he's tormented by constantly and only really just now moving on from. It's just... It's just a shitty scene. It makes me feel bad every time I see it. It's a bit similar to the point where Isidro is being an asshole to Shierke, and doesn't really see or understand the value in her hat or the pain of loss. Isidro is a pretty naive kid, and he has a very arrogant and immature view on the world, and because of that, I see him as an important piece of the puzzle. 
He is to represent people who idolize Guts and who only see Guts for the badass he is without seeing the nuance behind his character and the pain and torment he was forced to go through. Isidro is a Joker slash Taxi Driver slash Rick and Morty fan that quote unquote missed the point as it were. He hasn't really lived much and as a result doesn't really think about what someone else might be going through. He's one of those kids that just cannot read the room. We're shown an image of the Pope while all this goes on. Drawn in a dense layer of mediocrity. He's alone and isolated. Only living a life that is normal because he has absolutely zero drive to do better. The darkness consumes him, leaving only his horrified face. But soon the wings of Griffith illuminate him as they do everyone else around him. He sees that greatness and he wants to chase it. The fire wheel, I feel, is a nice touch to this fight, given it's an extremely important symbol to Berserk, but to every character, fire means something entirely different. For Guts, it's a memory of the only happiness he ever had. For Serpico and Farnese, it's freedom from the confines of their previous lives. For Shierke, it's her losing everything that was important to her. Fire always engulfs everyone's past, burning away with every passing second. But the past is what builds them into the people they become now. Without that fire, they have nothing. It's exactly what drives them. So of course she uses a wheel of fire. It represents her ambition in this fight. The wheel of flame resembles the moon of the eclipse, but in this context, it's here to protect our heroes. I think this odd contradiction, as well as the meaning of fire, is meant to say that the characters are trying to make the most out of their tormented past. The absolute brutality of this shit is so fucking goddamn good. We see Guts fucking rip open the beast from the inside. I love this goddamn manga so much. Guts also survives a fucking tornado, too, which I guess is symbolism of how unstable and wild his life is. I remember I saw this meme that tried to put Berserk in a nutshell, but to be honest, it's honestly pretty accurate. Every single fight in this entire series is treated like a language, telling you more and more about Guts as a character. You understand him more and more through every swing, so I would say this is definitely accurate in more ways than one. I guess now it's time to talk about Hinduism, and I looked into some of it because I was genuinely curious if that's what Kentaro Miura was actually trying to go for here. Kundalini in Hinduism is a form of divine energy supposedly located at the base of the spine. As snakes shed their skin through skinning, they are symbols of rebirth, transformation, immortality, and healing. Water in Hinduism has a special place because it is believed to have spiritually cleansing power. To Hindus, all water is sacred, especially rivers, and there are seven sacred rivers, which are all on screen. I, I, I'm, I'm not going to say these because I don't want to mispronounce them. Anyway, the use of a snake is great because it's a smaller body within a false shell. It's just like the stone statues from earlier, as well as the apostles. It's actually fucking impressive how well-researched Mira is on this kind of shit, and it's super rare for stories like this. Also, side note, I'm happy that Shierke is growing as well. This whole time, she was worried for Gut's safety. She didn't want to see him die, even though she wouldn't have been hurt. Little by little, she's growing and starting to care for others. Anyway, this dude gets his ass struck the fuck down by Ganishka in a matter of seconds. Like, like, this monster that Guts struggled against just gets struck down in one shot. Like, fuck. Lightning is a pretty cool symbol. It represents a god punishing his people. I guess in some ways, that's how he sees himself. Dude probably thinks he's fucking Zeus. He offers Guts to serve him once he sees Guts as above average as well, but Guts is just like... Nah, bro, I don't play that shit. Like, this guy is so cool, he just... He turns down... A fucking lightning monster that just that killed the dude he was fighting and struggling against in one shot like that's how not scared he is he's just so used to this shit at this point that he doesn't even experience fear anymore even though this lightning monster is towering over him he's not scared and he just looks him in the eyes if they're equals the strategy of using his sword to attract the electricity is both smart and important as, once again, this sword is the very thing to save his life. Also, I just want to say that if you are so much of a piece of shit, you make Guts team up with Zod, you might want to reconsider your decisions. Guts decides to help Zod when they see they have a common enemy, and this is full proof that he's moved on. He's put the past behind him, and while he certainly hasn't forgiven Griffith, he has let go and stopped letting it control and drive him. That said, Guts isn't really like Zod anymore. He doesn't falter, 
and he continues to fight for his own cause. It's actually why Sonya and Zod have a very interesting dynamic when they talk as well. She tells him to make a choice to cut his own path, just like Guts did. The only similarity that Zod has to Guts is that he's currently devoting his time to Griffith because, like Guts, he didn't have a purpose until he met him. Even though Zod knows what Griffith's ambition is and did the same thing he did, he was so overwhelmed with power he got bored and only survived. Guts getting to fight alongside Zod is easily one of the greatest moments in the entirety of Berserk, as well as Unexpected. It further cements that this is the point where Guts is finally moving on, and this entire arc was that journey to moving on. For just a moment, they put aside their differences and ride into the mist head-on in one of the most badass and fucking amazing parts of the entirety of Berserk. Afterwards, for just a moment, Guts begins to give in to his revenge urges, but Serpico assures him that he has come so far and no longer sees the need to settle the score. For what Guts had been through, it's impressive that he has the strength to say no to revenge. Guts is finally finding a way to be happy, and I couldn't be more happy for him. If you've been keeping up with these, you might have noticed that I glossed over some pretty important shit, and that is because it involves the scene that made this manga personal for me. I skipped over a very controversial Berserk scene that many people have had mixed reactions to. It's certainly one of the most difficult scenes in the manga. What else could I be referring to other than the infamous scene where Guts almost rapes Casca? The matter is made worse when the darkness within him appears in a dream, convincing him to kill the girl so they can resume hunting down Griffith without further interruption. At a certain point, she gets separated from Guts and runs into some peasants who try to rape her. She manages to kill them. But Guts finds her, and through the doing of a demon, ends up being controlled by the beast and was almost made to rape her as well as strangle her. Guts manages to stop himself, but the damage is done as Casca had lost her trust in him. This forces Guts to put her on a leash to keep her from wandering off, not caring if she resents him as long as he can take her to a safe place. He looks at Casca, longing for the way that things used to be. But in the state she's in, she's like a puppy that bites to escape and run away. We see her innocent smile encased in darkness, a poor innocent victim thrust in a world of anger and hate. She drowns in the horrifying memories of what happened. It's likely a stretch, but the fact that Casca killed these men in the state she was in especially during a traumatic episode from remembering what happened, makes me believe that for just a moment, the real Casca came out. I think for just a bit, Casca regained her senses in a fight-or-flight sense before reverting back to the vegetable state she's in now. But furthermore, I think this tells you a lot about Guts and the toxic mindset he's pushed himself into as a coping mechanism. Casca is the only person he's ever consented to, so I think in some ways it makes a lot of sense that he's sexually frustrated given the state she's in now, and especially frustrated at the humiliation of seeing someone else force himself onto her. I believe it could be intrusive thoughts regarding his sexual needs. I think he thinks these things, and then he pushes these things to the back of his head, because he knows that they're horrible to think, and that they'll do him no good anyway. His morals put a shackle on all of those selfish, lustful thoughts he has. The only reason he acted on these thoughts is because he was possessed. And as I said in my first part, a demon possessing you means that that moral shackle you put on those kinds of thoughts is no longer there. So, this is why I was wrong when I said that the prostitute scene at the very beginning of the story made no sense. It makes perfect sense. Guts specifically slept with her as an excuse to get that sexual energy out, but also to take care of another one of the apostles who had taken everything from him. It's highly likely he didn't consider it cheating on Casca, or he thinks their relationship is over now as a result of what happened. I love Berserk because Guts is a character who fights and fights and fights and fights no matter how horrible everything in his life gets. 
No matter how many horrible, terrible things happen to him, he just keeps getting up and fighting. And for a long time, through all of the horrible things that I've had happen to me, this story was a source of inspiration. That's why Berserk is my favorite manga of all time.